Yuri Watanabe is a doctoral candidate in English literature at Durham University. She is currently working on her thesis titled The Politics of Sympathy in Victorian Novels, a study of sympathetic representations of fallen women in the novels of Elizabeth Gaskell, George Eliot, George Moore and Thomas Hardy. Today's paper is based on her fifth chapter, which is specifically on Tess. Yuri completed her MA at the University of Tokyo, and which was also on ideas of sympathy in the works of Hardy. Can we all please welcome Yuri Watanabe? Thank you very much for the introduction, and thank you for having me here today. My presentation is called Sympathy and the Plurality of Purity in Hardy's Tessa de Dubervilles. The Victorian Valleys in Tessa de Dubervilles exhibits that Angel must abandon Tess and that she must suffer so. In today's eyes, may seem ridiculously outdated, and yet Tess is still read in the age of the Me Too movement. Tess was not radical when it was first published because of its subject. The fallen woman was a common figure in Victorian literature. Neither was Hardy's concentrated and sympathetic portrayal of the fallen woman rare or new. He had predecessors such as Elizabeth Gaskell's Ruth, published in 1853. By the 1890s, female sexuality was no longer a taboo, but had entered the political debate, exemplified by Josephine Butler's campaign to repeal the Contagious Diseases Acts, a law that endorsed the double standard. The decade in which Hardy wrote Tess, when rigid views of women were shifting, was ripe for him to explore a dialogic approach to the woman question. Up until then, the moral views of the middle and upper class Victorians of female sexuality were a single-minded and unified narrative. Women were either angels or fallen. Hardy contra- contracts this uh, view with one of his own. In the novel's subtitle, A Pure Woman, he explicitly suggests a cohesive argument in the defense of Tess. However, as readers quickly find, in the details of the text, especially those concerning the heroine, um, they are far from being unified, and this ambivalence has invited decades of critical debate over interpretations. What Hardy does, then, is to extend the definition of female purity beyond the narrow Victorian idea of sexual purity. In order to explore the plurality of purity in Hardy's tests, it is useful to borrow the uh, Russian philosopher and critic Mikhail Bakhtin's concept of heteroglossia. Bakhtin argues that uh, language, in quotations, uh, by which he means the set of rules through which speech and text work, is in itself a worldview which imposes specific limits to meaning and ways of seeing the subject. In this way, language can ensure the maximum of mutual understanding. The uniqueness of the novel form, however, is that multiple languages and voices are able to coexist and hold an interrelationship with each other. One obvious event example is in dialogue and conversations. I'm sorry, did I actually? I'm sorry. Um, each character might have a unique style of speaking. So in novels, each character might have a unique style of speaking, whether that be a dialect or family jargon, with its uh, special vocabulary and unique accentual systems. Tess can switch from speaking a dialect at home and standard English elsewhere. Angel, when dining with his family, lets slip a troubled haze expression, uh, quote, a drop of pretty tipple, which confuses his brothers. Bakhtin was this that these do not just reveal the character's quirks, but whole different ways of thinking, feeling, and living. And Tess Hardy writes, quote, Every village has idios- idiosyncrasy, its constitution, its own code of morality. Angel's older brothers are criticized for not seeing the differences between the local truth and the universal truth, that in the inner world, said in their clerical and academic hearing, was quite different thing from what was what the outer world was thinking. So the ethics of pluralism is an idea that originated as early as Johann Gottfried von Herder, um, uh, who is a key intellectual figure in the development of moral sentimentalism. Rather than insist that there is a single set of universal morals, Herder believed 
that a continuous reflection and refinement of our own moral sentiments can lead us to find justice that can only be, quote, shared by those of otherwise divergent and values, divergent values and worldviews. So in response to a single moral view held by the, his conservative readers, Hardy presents multiple and contradicting viewpoints of tasks, middle class, working class, religious, scientific, distanced, and intimate. By doing so, he expands the narrow definition of pure beyond sexual morality to test his biological nature, emotional sensitivity, and human kindness. So in the limited time I have for this presentation, I would like to look at first the legal language of purity, secondly, the natural law of purity, and thirdly, the language of social class, uh, before I conclude with a passage of Hardy's vision of a pure test. So first, the legal language of purity. What happened at that night um, in the chase remains a mystery, hidden by a fog. The text leaves us um, able to speculate whether Tess gave Alec her consent or not. So Tony Tanner most clearly states it was rape. Leon Waldorf believes it was seduction. Ian Gregor explains it was both rape and seduction. Still others, such as Kristen Brady and Ellen Rooney, agree that it is, argue that it's impossible to say. And H.M. Dalisky explains that within the narrator, there are two divergent views, which he calls the seer and seer. The seer's voice laments that Tess's guardian angel is absent, and his tone insists on a, a sinister Alec of violence and rape. On the other hand, the seer narrator neutrally describes concrete actions such as when Alec is concerned and even acts tenderly towards Tess, making it hard for the reader to see Alec as a rapist. Dalisky holds that there is nothing before the chase scene to suggest that Alec would rape Tess. Dalisky's account of a split narrator assists our Bakhtinian reading of Hardy's use of multiple voices, even though it may be a slight even um, oversimplification of the diversity of the moral debate. Alyssa Guzman's article, which finds striking similarities between Tess and the 2015 trial of Brock Allen Turner, brings attention to the crucialness of deciphering whether the victim was raped or seduced. On it depends justice and the preservation of the female victim's purity. Accused of raping an unconscious woman, Turner hired a powerful attorney and private investigator to probe into the victim's personal life to use against her. If the victim failed to prove that she was raped, it was her character that was compromised. On the other hand, clearing Tess's name by clarifying that she was raped does not seem to be a priority of Hardy's. In fact, critics have found that Hardy made changes to later editions of the text, which actually increased ambiguity. Of course, one should continue, uh, consider how the Victorian double standard would crudely have made no distinction between rape, seduction, or prostitution. However, Hardy's notebook shows his awareness of rape cases reported in the newspaper. William Davis Jr. believes that it likely that Hardy was familiar with the English law relating to rape, and he could also expect his readers to be. Thus, Hardy's deliberate ambivalence be between rape and seduction seems more than simply reflecting the ideologies of his time. Um, Penny Wilmlima writes that Hardy tries to preserve the narrow balance between Tess's awareness of the sexual force, for sh she remains wholly unaware she is merely a passive and stupid victim, and her refusal deliberately to exploit it, for that would involve her too actively as a temptress. And William Davis Jr., who argued that Hardy had adequate material to present Tess as a rape case, but kept Tess away from an apparently sympathetic judicial system, concludes that, quote, seduction has mainly moral implications, while rape has mainly legal ones. Um, Hardy, I believe, wanted Tess's sexuality and the matter of her purity to be considered in the minds of his readers, rather than argued with perhaps predictable results in a fictional court of law. He also continues, to have Tess's status as pure victim following the rape amplified in a court scene will perhaps settle the question of your purity too easily, and Hardy does not want that. Instead, he uses the expansiveness afforded by the novel form, 
rather than a single scene, to argue for a definition of hu- a female purity that includes Tess's sexual nature and her sexual responses to men. Some of Hardy's t- contemporary readers agreed that Tess's uh, purity stemmed from her whole being. For example, Richard Le Galeen uh, reviewed that, the mo- quote, the motives of Tess is one of those simple and yet how crucially tangled sexual situations around which the whole creation moves and in which Mr. Hardy delights to find the external meanings. End of quote. Also, Clementina Black declared that the novel's, quote, essence lies in the perception that a woman's moral worth is measurable not by any one deed, but by the whole aim and tendency of her life and nature. End of quote. Both of these Victorian critics insightfully make the contrast between the simple and the whole creation, between the one deed to Tess's whole life and nature, Hardy's expansion of representation results from the ambiguity of languages regarding Tess's rape-slash-seduction by Alec, and can be seen as to effectively add plurality to the definition of Tess's purity. Uh, The second is uh, faithful to instinct the language of nature. The unfavorable Victorian reviewer, R. H. Hutton, wrote that Tess acts, quote, not due to an instinct of purity, but to an instinct of mere timidity and disgust. Hutton, coming from a mainstream religious point of view, believes that if fine natures will not faithfully adhere to such genuine instincts as they have, they may deteriorate and will deteriorate in consequence of that faithfulness. Faithlessness. Hutton repeats the key words pure, instinct, nature, and faithful, which frequently appear in Hardy's writing. Like with purity, Hardy expands the meanings of these terms as well. What does it mean to be, a faith, uh, to be faithful to pure instinct? In Hutton's definition of pure instinct, there is no room for timidity, disgust, personal pride, or the, quote, the strange and horrible mix of, of feelings. Such feelings are repressed, and passion is met with duty. However, Hardy argues that being pure is accepting weaknesses and flaws. Quote from Tess, and it was the touch of the imperfect upon the would be perfect that gave it the sweetness, because that it was that which gave the humanity. Immediately following this quote, Hardy playfully illustrates how Claire's excitement for Tess's beauty develops into a sneeze. A sneeze is a spontaneous and unrepressed moment of weakness, but is nothing to condemn. Hardy's text in Hardy's text Purity is linked with one's body, the organic nature of it, and its response to feelings and instinct. Here's an example. Since spirit rose within her automatically as the sap in the, tw- in the twigs, it was unexpected youth surging up anew from its temporary check and bringing with it hope and the invincible instinct towards self-delight. This passage portrays Tess from the point of view of the natural world, By the time Tess leaves her family for the second time, it is clear that it is something biological within her which is heavily linked to the changing season environment that prompts her to begin life anew. It is of a similar logic that the narrator describes the nature of Tess and Angel's inevitably falling in love with each other. As the spring season develops and matures, so too does Tess and Angel's relationship. The summer comes with the heat and nature intensifies. Um, amid the oozing fatness and warm ferments of the var vale, at the season when the rush of juices could almost be heard below the hiss of fertilization, it was impossible that the most fanciful love should not grow passionate. The ready blossoms existing, they were impregnated by their surroundings. Speaking of Tess's natural impulse and instinct, a scene equally debated by critics over interpretation is the one with Tess walking through the overgrown garden at Table Days, enticed by Angel's heart playing. So, um, the scene has been used by critics discussing Tess's sexuality by arguing that the garden symbolizes sexual passion, noting that the scene is filled uh, with sensual descriptions of profusion of growth, crackling snails, and thistle milk and slug slime which stained Tess's naked arms. However, reading the garden scene in regards to Tess's sexual purity is again full of ambiguity. On one hand, critics such as 
Robert Riddle and Dorothy Van Ghent interpret the scene as foreshadowing how Angel will violate Tess. However, David Lodge argues that the garden is not a negative presence to Tess. He writes, there is a kind of sensuous relish enforced by the rhythm and alliteration in this um, in the sensuous relish enforced by the rhythm and mental alliteration in the thickening consonants of cucklespittle, crackling snails, thistle milk, and slug slime, which are strangely disarming. If Hardy had intended to stress the unpleasantness of the garden, Lodge argues, he has gone the task in a curious way. Tess seems at home in it. On the other hand, it can be said that if Hardy intended to stress the at home of the garden, he also goes about his task in a curious way. The garden is not a familiar English garden, nor a garden of Eden. It is not idealized, but is a strange mixture of experience. For example, the blooming weeds form a polychrome of dazzling as that of cultivated flowers. But at the same time, the weeds are emitting offensive smells. The crackling snails are part of the string of pleasant, alluring alliteration. But when we stop to consider what it looks like in reality, the cracking very ominously suggests of stepping on and breaking the snails underfoot, a far from pleasant thought. It is extremely difficult to find a word which adequately uh, describes the garden. It is pleasing to those who like this kind of central experience, while others may find the slime and smells repulsive. Notwithstanding, the remarkable thing about how Hardy has portrayed this garden is that whatever one's opinion of the garden may be, whether one finds it offensive or pleasing, it is still possible to see how it can be the other. In other words, the garden is controversial, yet neutral, and above all fascinating. Like the Dutch still life flower paintings which capture flowers in each moment, budding in full bloom, wilting, insect eaten, and brown, Hardy's garden also captures profusion and decay through his scientific, meticulous attention to details of nature, art, um, of nature, art and beauty are born. The difficulty of evaluating the garden runs parallel to the difficulty of evaluating tests. But the message here is not to judge good or offensive, but to be awed by the fullness of nature, both in beauty and decay. So third, the language of society and class. The Darwinian language of evolution in nature had heavily influenced uh, Victorian society. On one hand, it diversified understanding of nature and humans, unsettled traditional thinking and set new problems. But on the other, it merged with existing languages and reinforced society's oppression of the socially disadvantaged, especially of women and the working class. During the 1870s, evolutionary theory made social implications regarding the relations of men and women in the idea of sexual selection. Um, that is, men selecting women for wives, largely influenced by their social position and wealth. Hardy explores this, and how the oppression of love for Angel overcomes not only Tess, but the other dairy mates. A quote from Tess, the air of the sleeping chamber seemed to palpitate with the hopeless passion of the girls. They writhed vividly under the oppressiveness of an emotion thrust upon them by a cruel nature's law, an emotion which they had neither expected nor desired. Note here that the language regarding nature has turned negative, hopeless, feverish, oppressive, and cruel. Nature is wonderfully inspiring, but also death-giving. It is summarized by Hardy in, a, in his phrase, a killing joy, which is bursting with paradox. However, the energy of this language is different from the garden scene we have discussed earlier, in which the coexistence of bloom and decay was a form of beauty. The agony of the dairy maids come from the awareness that they have no chance of winning angels' affections. Their passions, which arise naturally according to the biological design, quote, lack nothing in the eye of nature. However, in the eye of society, they, being working class, do not qualify for the middle class marriage selection process. Tess is no exception. While she is advantaged by her old ancestry and beauty, both important criteria in sexual selection, social insistence on virginity, virginity disqualifies her. Um, so now looking at the dialogue of languages, while the contrasting languages of nature and social law seem impossible to naturalize, Tess is very much about the coexistence of differences. 
Bakhtin writes that languages opposed to one another in novels are not just contrasted with each other, but they are also in dialogue. There is a difference between the painted red words on the style, thy damnation slumbereth not, and Tess's conversation with the vicar about the burial of her child. The crude slogan is a one-sided statement that leaves no space for response or change. On the other hand, Tess's dialogue with the vicar, however little, allows him to struggle with himself. Critics such as Margaret Higgonet uh, focuses on the vicar's attempt to silence Tess's female voice. Um, the vicar says, don't talk so rashly. But the meaning of the vicar's sympathetic choice to bend the rules for Tess, though we may criticize its meagerness, is still significant. The vicar's sympathy and hypocrisy are incongruous, but they can coexist in Tardy's text, each complicating the existence of the other. And that complicated estranglement of languages is exactly what delays the reader's moral judgment of the characters. So Angel is another character who fails to synthesize with his beliefs um, and practices, and it takes him a journey to a foreign country and an encounter with extreme climate to begin seeing morality from a plural perspective. But even before that, after Tess's confession on their wedding night, uh, where there are heavy-handed descriptions of how Angel's mind is hardened, blocked, and immovable, also dotted throughout the text are statements to show that Angel is comp- cap- capable of changing. The narrator reveals that Angel, quote, wished for a moment that he had responded yet more kindly and kissed her once at least. Um, while smothering his affection for her, the narrator describes, a tear descended slowly upon his cheek, a tear so large that it magnified the pores of the skin over which it rolled like the object lens of a microscope. The metaphor of the microscope alludes strongly to the scientific um, gaze, the kind of hard and cold gaze which does not acknowledge the subject as a human being. However, another reading is possible, that is, by understanding the Victorian fascination of the microscope. It was during the 19th century that the microscope gained more accuracy and became affordable to the general public. 19th century guidebooks on using the microscope instructed the reader, um, quote, not for the careful empirical work of the laboratory, but rather for the imprecise, imaginatively stimulating exploration of the natural world. Um, The microscope, like other instruments associated with vision and eyesight, drastically changed one's perspective. But the microscope is, in particular, opened up new ways of seeing objects that have always been in one's daily life at a close proximity. Proximity. Edward Langster's guidebook, called Half Hours with the Microscope, published in 1859, encouraged readers to go off with the microscope to explore nearby gardens in, in the country to use, see ordinary objects transformed beyond their imagination. Read in this context, Angel's Teardrop, which acts like a microscope, is a symbol of the text's desire for a paradigm shift, for Angel to see Tess beyond what his bare eyes can perceive. I would like to conclude by looking at one final and favorite passage from Tess. Um, Quote, Thus Tess walks on, a figure which is part of the landscape, a field woman, pure and simple, in winter guise, a grey serge cape, a red woolen caravan, a stuffed skirt um, covered by the whitey-brown rough wrapper and buff leather gloves. Every thread of that old attire has become faded and thin under the stroke of raindrops, the burn of sunbeams, and the stress of winds. In this passage, which is accentuated by the rare use of the present tense, the narrator argues for a picture of Tess's purity. The narrator paints Tess as taking part in the natural landscape, and the details of her clothes simply uh, signify her social class. But the description is kept pure and simple. That is, the eye is open-minded, and there is no indication of judgment. Tess is pure and simple because she is viewed as any working woman that one might chance to see in a Dorset landscape. There is nothing to expose her affair with Alec or her abandonment by Angel. However, at the same time, the narrator's microscopic point of view, focusing on every thread, 
uh, feels the raindrop sunbeams and winds on the fabric. And with those faded threads, we too feel each passing season which Tess has experienced. Through the novel, Hardy represents Tess from multiple perspectives so that the reader may share in the plurality of her purity. Thank you.